save a prayer for those who care. I keep the faith, but no one will dare to hold my hand until the end. When all the pieces fall into place, my body is weak, the mind is tired. But there's a fire that heals deep inside. I close my eyes and stretch my soul to gather up the nerve to carry on. Don. Hello, hello. Hello. Hi, how are you? Excellent. It's nice welcome, to see you. Welcome to Marvel Talks. Finally, we managed to put this together. Despite the electricity going out this morning, despite my generator not working this morning, despite me having to rely on the hospitality of one of the local hotels, thank you very much to the Airy Lagoon here in the Gumbo. I think everything is setting us up for an exciting discussion. And Inshallah. let me... Let me also welcome our viewers who are slowly gathering before the stage in the various platforms. I will say a few things about Dawn. Dawn is a workplace culture advisor, an author and speaker. She is the founder of PDSI, which helps individuals and teams drive organizational and behavioral change. Dawn's first book was Managing the Matrix. The Heart Talk Handbook is her second. Don speaks regularly at events and in the media on any topic where people and business intersect. Is this an accurate snapshot of what you do? That'll do it. I'm doing it all from Sri Lanka now, though, not from Dubai. How's the weather in Sri Lanka right now? It's lovely. It's a little bit warm, as you can probably tell from sort of how shiny I look. Um, mm -hmm. But it's about 30 degrees, so significantly cooler than it would be in my second home of Dubai. Uh, so, yeah, it's lovely. And um, let me turn you around so you can just see my view. Ooh, it's a I nice gray day here. But picturesque. This is where I am. With the picturesque, exactly. Fantastic, fantastic. So, Don, what's your story? I know that you were an educator in the previous chapter of your life. And now you are a consultant, a coach. Can you tell us a bit about your pivot, about your shift into what it is that you do now? So I was, I was a teacher basically the whole of my life. Um, my parents will tell you a story about me being four years old and teaching a, a girlfriend I was at school with uh, Irish verbs. So we have our own language in Ireland and we would learn urim, earth, air, er, 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 er. And we would go, we'd start at the top of the stairs and as she got something right, we would go down a step and as she got it wrong, we had to go to the top of the stairs and start again. So I was always going to be a teacher. That was always going to be inevitable. Uh, but when I finished university, I ended up going to Japan for a year and ended up staying three, doing a thing called the JET program. Then moved to China. So I taught Chinese teachers of English and uh, then in Thailand and then back to the UK, where again, I was teaching in some challenging schools in London. And I loved it. It was the best job I ever had. I learned so much, but then I got a disease. I got a, a disease called psoriatic arthritis. So very quickly, in a matter of a very few weeks, I became quite ill. And although, thank God, I managed to get some good uh, drugs and, 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 and get it under control, it took, it took a while. And I was never going to be physically fit enough to work in the public school sector again in, in the UK, in the state school system in the UK. So I moved into the private sector and um, basically do the same thing, still teaching, just with grown-ups now. Fantastic. Training for adults. That's a yeah, and the coaching thing happened actually quite peculiarly. So I moved from private to public, sorry, public to private sector. And I was lucky enough to be sent on an exec ed course in Stanford. And one of the professors said, how long have you been coaching? And I said, what, what's coaching? And he said, you know, coaching, executive coaching. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, oh, I've been listening to you talk to people and you have all these coaching conversations. And I was like, oh my God, that's a thing you can do for a living? That's amazing. And that's how I ended up moving into, into this world. So what skills would you say that you have carried with you in your suitcase going from the public to the private sector? Have you found any of, of your previous skills valuable for it's really, you? It's a really good question. I think one of the things that teachers... Te teachers are leaders, right? They are by definition. They're going mm. into a room, um, often six or eight different rooms in a day, trying to get 30 people, 
because that's what children are, they're people, to follow them. You don't actually have any power over them beyond the power that you that you create. So I think there's there's that. There's that sense of being able to walk in and 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 have some kind of ability to make a room listen to you. Um, but I think there's also the sense that people need accountability. People need things explained to them very simply, and then they need to be bought into that. And then once they've been bought into it, they need to be held accountable. Children, just like adults, we need that accountability. Um, in terms of other things, moving from, from the public sector into the private sector, I don't think I'm scared of a lot. So when I moved into the private sector, one of my first uh, meetings was with a private equity firm, um, talking with the head of learning and development there and asking, asking for work. And she said, oh, you know, our, pre our private equity guys can be quite difficult. Mm -hmm. And I promise you, compared to a group of 32, year, 32 mm -hmm. 15 year old boys on a hot May afternoon, nothing is difficult, nothing. It's a completely different world communicating with kids as opposed to with adults different I'm, I'm, not sure. I'm, I'm not sure it is completely different i'm really not sure it is i think that whoever you're talking to whether that's a group of japanese businessmen or a group of saudi um saudi female graduates or it's a group of 15 year old south london kids I think the, the key is always to try and imagine what they know and imagine what they don't know and imagine what they need to know. So whenever you're trying to communicate, you're starting with that other person in mind, I think. So perhaps the, the, the perception is different in that adults get more easily bored. They, their, their attention span is... But at the end of the day, even kids have a short attention span. You know, they, they, go, yeah. they go off on tantrums. So maybe... Maybe they're not that different after all. Right? It's just a perception. No, and and I, I think as well, given given how short my attention span has become over the last couple of years, I'm not sure that the average teenager is any any worse than I am. So when you when you entered the private sector and the and you, you began delving into different corporate cultures, what was your first, let's say, experience of working with a corporate culture. Do you remember any worst stories, any, any things to share? Yeah, actually, so, so, so my very first experience was working with um, an organization that had just merged. So it was mm. basically an American organization and I, some kind of North European, I want to say Norwegian, but I don't remember the details. And they had been, they had not just come from different national cultures but they were also whilst in the same industry they had been competitors for many years mm -hmm. and they they had now merged of course it wasn't a merger right it was an acquisition it's always an acquisition there's never in my experience i've never been involved with a merger there's always somebody acquiring somebody else and i had got involved with these guys maybe a year and a half after the merger and I was doing a piece of consultancy work that involved me going out and talking to a lot of different departments. And my first conversation with the CEO was to say, hey, Mr. CEO, I think you've got a bigger problem here than you realize. And he was like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, okay, every, literally everybody in the organization is still referring to us versus them, the old mm -hmm. company versus you know, the, the, the two, company A and company B, were still us versus them. Even in the, in, the, in the finance department, they were still doing different invoicing templates because nobody had managed the culture. Everybody had looked at the, at the, um, at, at the balance sheet, yeah, but nobody yeah. had looked at the actual behaviors and the cultures. And it was, it was a real problem because nobody had, nobody had been putting any effort into this. Now, once the CEO realized that, then we were able to put some effort into it and we were able to move things along quite quickly. But left to their own devices, people don't automatically get together and merge. That's a great example. In my country, there was a, a merger a few years ago between two big shipping companies. I will not mention names. And one of the shipping companies had a culture of being, you know, the big spenders, the bon vivers, the, the big life going out there. And, you know, the other company, they were low profile, you know, it's a reflection of the leadership compounding over time, right? Low profile, not spending a lot on social activities, on marketing. And when the two companies merged, uh, people were celebrating at the top, but there was 
the dynamics in the culture were chaotic. You know, there were cliques, silos, and this thing escalated a couple of years later, and the whole thing collapsed. Okay, the, on, on the corporate level, the ownership is still the same, but they went back to the, you know, the, dyna the dynamics are so compelling in such situations that if you don't manage to harness them and to align people, processes, and expectations, you have a time bomb in your hands. What do you think? Well, the, the frustrating thing is that there will have been people in both of those organizations who knew that was happening. There will be, there will have been people in those organizations who could have, who did predict it. And they either didn't speak up or they didn't speak up effectively enough to be heard, or they did speak up, but their senior leadership weren't listening. And mm. that's, what's, that's what frustrates me is so often we see something that's almost inevitable we can see the avalanche coming down the hill and we're not doing anything about it. We just wait until it overwhelms us. And then we start trying to dig out from underneath the snow. Whereas actually, you know, we could build something in advance because we know that there's going to be an avalanche. So at the end of the day, what's the recipe for preventing such a catastrophe from happening? How can you, in the context of a, a, an anticipated merger or reorganization, how can you preempt such extremely harmful consequences from arising? Is there a magic well, It involves having difficult conversations in advance rather than mm. at the time, right? It's, it's about being very, very clear about who you are. So listen, I'll tell you, every single organization I go into tells me that they have a culture of transparency. <laughs> every single one. And I promise you that is not true of 95% of them. Right. So let's not kid ourselves here. If you're going to, ma if, you, if, you, if you're, look, it's like getting married, right? It's like going out and, get, and dating. You can kid yourself that you're the kind of person that likes, I don't know, long walks on the beach and French movies with subtitles and museum visits. But actually, if you're the kind of person who enjoys going to the movies and eating popcorn and drinking a Diet Coke, then you should probably try and find somebody who matches you rather than somebody that you want to aspire to be. Mm. So it's about understanding ourselves, understanding the culture that we actually have, not the culture that we wish we had. And then saying, well, okay, how will that match? If, if we do get involved with these guys, what, what are we going to have to change? And, and not every culture needs to be the same. It, it's not that, you know, to use your example of the two companies, the big spenders and the, and the, you know, the little mice. It's not saying one of those is better than the other. Either is fine. It's about being clear on what you're trying to achieve, what your strategic goals are, and what values, and therefore way more importantly, what behaviors actually underpin those those strategic goals. And I suppose to... also, hmm? please go ahead, sorry. Do you need to involve also the people in the discussion about such a, okay, we are talking about mergers now, which is a a topic in and by itself, but to what extent should we involve the people when we want to merge cultures? Well, I suppose it depends on the size of the organization, mm -hmm. the age of the organization, the maturity of the organization. But I would, I would argue that whenever you're doing anything around culture, you have to involve way more people than you would like to, almost certainly. So if you think about what culture is, what is culture? It's an amalgamation of all the behaviors in an organization. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a plane going overhead now, just in case, you know, there wasn't enough stuff going wrong with my day to day in terms of technology, technology. Um, so it's, it's, it really genuinely is about working out what it is that you need to achieve and then going backwards from that. Yeah, I think that's a very fair point. And it also touches, of course, on, on change management. I mean, you need to embrace change management in a very effective way. That's one of the points I have here as well. And in my experience, uh, leadership is fundamental in navigating through change. And my question to you is, what's the role of a leader uh, in cases whereby we want to change or we want to calibrate or adapt or adjust our culture? Well, what, first what should of all, a leader do? Hmm? 
first of all, I think we need to be really clear about, about what we mean by a leader. A leader isn't necessarily just somebody sitting on the senior leadership team or at the C-level. We have leaders all the way through an organization. And if you want to see genuine change and you want to see that sustained, my goodness, you better get all of those people involved. Mm -hmm. You need to get them on board because if you don't, you're done. Um, in, in terms of what it takes, in all honesty, cultural change isn't that hard. It's, 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 that's not fair. It is. It's really, really difficult. It's not. It's not difficult at all. But it is really, really hard. It's actually super simple, right? It's about it's, it's about answering some super simple questions like who are we? What are we here for? What do mm. we care about? What behaviors, what behaviors do we need to see? What behaviors are we not going to accept? What ones are we going to praise and reward? And what ones are we going to control and punish? Mm. None of that's particularly difficult. What it is is hard because it involves getting clarity, and nobody wants to get clarity because as soon as you've got clarity then you, you can be held accountable. It in, and then it involves consistency. It involves genuinely sweating the small stuff. It involves spotting every single behavior that works towards what you're trying to achieve and applauding it, rewarding it, and spotting every single behavior that does not work for you and stopping it, nipping it in the bud. And that might involve some very difficult conversations. And it might, it often does, involve conversations that don't just go down the hierarchy, but go across the hierarchy mm. and up the hierarchy. And they're a lot harder to have, particularly for, you know, depending on where you come from and the kind of culture you come from. Like peer conversations and conversations at various management levels and so on. So on the leadership, let me not refer to a leader, you're correct, let me refer to leadership in general. I think leadership, you have said something important is about taking your organization somewhere so uh, unless you you want to take your organization somewhere i don't think you are a leader right leader leading means i want to take my people somewhere or i'm taking them or i'm changing course so if i want to change course i want to take everyone on board now the leadership in my experience leadership in my experience when they when they want to embrace change often fear failure what i mean by that is many leaders feel overwhelmed by the possibility of failure when deciding to change okay and i i think that the problem there is the the perception that change will be perfect what you said before is correct in that it's simple to have a specific goal in mind. What is more difficult when you're sweating the small stuff is to accept that things will go wrong. For example, let's say that I want to reorganize my company and move people from one team to another, do some internal restructuring so that I become a more tech savvy organization or so that I change my niche, right? If in my change management plan, I anticipate that everyone will come along and they don't, some people just decide to leave, for example, because of many reasons, changes in status, changes in, in relationships with other people, you know very well. I may feel that the whole thing is failing, collapsing, that I am incompetent, that, that the whole thing is crumbling and so on. The, the whole thing and the whole trick in my book is that to effect change, you have to accept that things will go off, that things will go wrong, that some people may jump ship. So when these things happen, you know that they were part of the plan. So the loss of control, I think, the feeling of loss of control is one of the things that erodes confidence in leadership when dealing with change. What is your view on that? Yeah, well, I mean, at the moment, Philippos, to talk about lack of control, I think the whole world is going, <laughs> oh, yeah, no, 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 I hear you on that one. We've all got a lot better at dealing with a lack of control and a, and, a, and a lot more ambiguity. Yeah, yeah, we hear you on that. But look, you're right. It's inevitable with any change, with any change program that something's going to go wrong. What frustrates me is the inability to have that conversation up front. Mm. So I was doing some work with an organization um, and this, this work did not end well. And I will tell you why, because when we did the first piece of work, I said, okay, so what are we trying to achieve guys? And the answer was, you know, mm -hmm. something vague and fuzzy and wonderful. 
And I said, okay, so let's break it down into what you actually want to achieve. Let's get into the into the specifics. So we had a little bit of <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit of pushback around that, but we got there. So I said, okay, so things that are that you got going for you guys right now in terms of tech, in terms of structure, in terms of people, in terms of financing, in terms of organization, in terms of all the different things that you might have that will help you to get you get you from here to there. Let's make a list of them. And the group of people are like, yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's write down all the brilliant things about us that are going to get us from here to there. Fantastic, very upbeat. Okay, okay. now let's make a list of all the things that are going to stop you. Mm. Crickets in the room. And I was, I was surprised by how how bad the reaction was. So normally there'd be a little, you know, people would be a little bit unlikely, a little mm. bit loath to talk about negatives, but they get over it quite quickly. In this scenario, the CEO who was in the room said, and he literally said, Dawn, I don't think we need to deal with that. And I said, okay, so we're going to take a break right now. And so we took a break and I spoke with the CEO and I said, so what do you mean we don't need to deal with this? He goes, well, we don't, we don't need to deal with it. I said, we don't need to deal with potential obstacles, potential challenges with, with the things that are going to stop you from getting there. He said, no, I, I don't want to talk about that because, you know, what if, what if we put ideas in their head? So what you mean, what, we put ideas in the head of your senior leadership team. Wow. You know, this, this organization has a lot more problems. It suddenly becomes apparent. And uh, you will not be surprised to hear that their change management program did not work out terribly well. Because, the, you know, there was the illusion of alignment. You know, there is the illusion or the self-illusion of alignment. In, in this case, it's or we are hiding things under the carpet. You know, there are different cliques, different teams, and we don't want to upset vested interests, but we want change. I mean, <laughs> what do you want at the end of the day? Do you want change or do you want people to f continue their old, old ways? And I think vested interests in particular are incredibly compelling obstacles. You know, if I have you're my going team, to have hmm? If you're going to have successful change, you need to have conflict and you need to build that conflict into the process. Conflict is not a dirty word. We need conflict. It's through conflict that we get better decisions made and we see those decisions implemented more effectively. We see them implemented with less stress, with less grief, with less time on overrun, with less budget overrun, if we can get it done up front. But the, the temptation is to say, what? There's an elephant in the room? I don't see an elephant in the room. What elephant? And then wait until suddenly you're overpowered by the smell of elephant poo. Mm. Instead, acknowledge the elephant is there. Let's, you know, arrange a system for getting rid of the elephant poo. Conflict. So, which takes me to hard conversations, which is your latest book and which is a considerable part of what you do. Am I right? It's not my latest book. My latest book is a book all about culture the C word and we were going to launch it two weeks ago in San Diego but coronavirus sadly took away from that oh. so we're rewriting yeah so we're so what we're doing now is we're doing a couple of cultural change projects remotely um, which you know never done that before because why would you have done and then we'll rewrite the book to um, to incorporate what we learn about how to do that that's that's what we're what, what I'm at the, at the moment okay so the the C for culture is is coming up right C words, yeah. Um, it's so it's 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 written like my first book. It's written like a novel, um, mm -hmm. so it's a consultant going in and working with a senior leadership team. Ooh. But the idea is that it will be for any HR generalist or any leader at any level in an organization as a kind of how-to okay. book. How how do you, what, what what is the process that you might go through as part of a cultural change project? And so the okay. book itself will be a resource, but we'll also have some other resources there for people to use. But as Excellent. I say, we're, we're, we're writing it right now because nobody's ever done this before. Nobody's done a cultural change project remotely before. So, yeah, we're working it out. It's a very timely matter as well, you know, managing culture during the COVID uh, madness. <laughs> okay. Well, so so I, I, we called it the C word for culture. And now, of course, we've got the coronavirus. So it's the C word. Another C word. You know, the other C word. My God. Yeah. So going back to your previous book then, The Hard Talks. Uh, what are difficult conversations in a nutshell? Any conversation where you're not getting the result that you want, 
whether that's private, you know, in your private life or in your in your personal life or in your work life, any conversation where you're either not speaking up and therefore nothing's changing or you're speaking up, but you're doing so in a way that you're still not getting what you want. Sort of uh, they can from, so so the, the, the best example, the example that we get everywhere we go, anywhere I go to speak, anytime I'm, I'm talking about the book, anytime I'm doing this training, it's always Dawn. There's somebody in my office who smells really bad. Can you tell me how to tell them that? That's the one. You know, I said, don't sweat the small stuff. You do. You need to sweat, literally sweat the mm. small stuff. Pun intended. So the other yeah, one very is very Yeah. So let me flip the question. What is an easy conversation? <laughs> an easy conversation is one where there's no um, disagreement. There's mm. no confusion. There's no mis misunderstanding. And and it doesn't matter very much, or it doesn't matter very much. So in all honesty, I could have a conversation with some random person I meet on the on the on a train tomorrow, not that I'm getting on a train tomorrow, but anyway, um, some random person I meet tomorrow, and maybe we disagree about something really, really fundamental. But I don't care about this person. It's not important to me what they think. It's not important to me that they change their mind. That's not a difficult conversation. Yeah. I don't care enough. So I have to be emotionally invested or at least, you know, care enough about it to want to behave well, to want to get long-term results different from the ones I'm getting. Fantastic. And almost by definition, when you've got those two things, when you've got something where you care about the subject mm -hmm. and there's a difference of opinion, almost by definition, you now got emotions involved. And when you've got emotions involved, human beings, we're very much led by our emotions. Then the whole key in hard talk is how do you, how do you stop that and get control of your emotions again? so that you can behave in the way that gets you the results or makes it more likely that you get the results that you want in the longer term. I've watched an interview of yours recently talking about how the brain I, operates. I bet I had nice hair because it was pre-COVID. <laughs> uh, and then you used a great analogy, the story using Homer Simpson eating donuts and Spock from Star Trek. Can you share the story with us just because it's fascinating so so the idea here is that we our brains are almost two brains and in order to make this really easy to remember we decided to talk about homer simpson and spock so homer simpson is the amygdala it's the back of your brain it's the monkey brain the lizard brain it's the really really old part of the brain it's the brain that works almost on automatic pilot it's the one that goes <laughs> donuts <laughs> and then you eat the three donuts and you don't think about six weeks from now and what you're going to look like or how you're going to feel after eating all the donuts you just do what feels good mm. in that moment so it's homer simpson that reacts when we are when, when you see a shadow at night and you suddenly do that and you run away or when you hear somebody say your name you automatically mm. react to it that's homer simpson now, Mr. Spock is different. Mr. Spock is who you think is in charge. Mr. Spock is what we like to think about when we think of our brain. So Mr. Spock is that front bit of our brain. It's the prefrontal cortex. It's the executive decision-making part mm. of the brain. It's the bit that's logical and is capable of thinking about the future. It's the bit that says, no, I'm not going to have the donuts because that way I'll be able to fit into the dress that I want to wear at the thing three weeks from now. So what you want in charge in your conversations is Mr. Spock. However, what mostly is in charge is Homer because mm. of the way our brains are set up. So our brains, our brains are set up to deal with threats. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, our ancestors, 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 they were going down the savanna. And when they were, uh, when they, when they perceived a threat, when there was a rustling in the, in the bush, for example, it wasn't Mr. Spock who got involved. Mr. Spock didn't exist then. It wasn't mm. Mr. Spock going, oh, I wonder what's in here. Let me investigate. It was Homer Simpson going, okay, scary thing in there. I'm going to do one of two things. I'm either going to get a big stick and beat it over the head with a, with, you know, beat the bush with it, or I'm going to run away. I'm going to fight or flight. And the problem mm. that we have is that our brain still works like that. So when we perceive a threat, whether that's um, a direct report being disrespectful or a boss, uh, hiding the, the credit, taking the credit, or um, a colleague shifting blame, then our, our brain reacts by putting Homer Simpson in charge, which is a shame because it's, a, it's at that exact moment that we need Mr. Spock to be in charge. So a huge part of hard talk about the book and the training program is really about managing that. It's about getting Homer Simpson to shut up 
and getting Mr. Spock back in charge so that we can behave in a way that makes it more likely that we get what we want. So what they say that we should follow your gut instinct is not applicable in difficult conversations? Well, not really, no. So we, we talk about, please, we talk about how this is really about learning to respond and not react. Mm. So your gut instinct will, will always be Homer and it will always be what feels good in the moment. So we had, myself and my colleague, Sarah, we had, uh, we had a supplier about a year and a half ago who was very, very difficult to work with, unbelievably difficult to work with. And if I had followed my gut instinct, I would have used a lot of bad language and I would have told mm. him to get lost. Um, and it would have felt fantastic in those few minutes, but it would have left me without that particular supplier that I needed. And it was going to take time to move over to, to, to do a changeover. So I had to get Homer to be quiet, get Mr. Spock mm. in charge and, and behave in a way that was going to work for me in the short to, sorry, in the medium to long term, rather than what would feel good in that moment. At the end of the day, if you have a spe specific goal or target on one hand, and on the other hand, you have the potential satisfaction of the donut, of, of just speaking up your mind without any filter and without tact. You need to weigh what matters to you most. If the target or, no. or, the, or the goal is more important for you, you might as well employ hmm, a rational. But, here, here, but here's the thing, you're doing what people do and they, they, they make this false dichotomy between, I can either speak up or I can shut up. And it's not that. You don't have to speak up in a way that ruins a relationship. You can mm. speak up in a way that actually enhances the relationship, particularly, by the way, if you're thinking about it professionally. So most of, most of us, most of the people listening to this are going to be knowledge workers. And as Harvard Business School tells us, the, the point of a knowledge worker is to make a good decision. In other words, the point of most of us mm. is to get what's between here and here out effectively and into other people's heads so that we all collectively make better decisions mm. and get stuff done more effectively. So, so it's not this false dichotomy between shutting up or speaking up and getting a bad result. We can speak up and get a good result. Mm. Now, is it easy? Great. Of course not. Hold it hard mm. talk. It's, it's not easy. So what skills do we need to face or to navigate difficult conversations effectively? Okay, so first of all, this is a whole book and a 20 hour training program. So forgive me for not covering it all. <laughs> uh, but what I will say is we, we look at hard talk in, in four phases. So we, we say work hard, speak soft, listen hard, finish hard. So the idea here is that the skills in listening and speaking, listening hard and speaking soft are not mind blowing. Honestly, if you've been on a leadership development program, mm. if you've read um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, you, 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 you know what the skills are for listening. You know what the skills are for speaking up. You know that you shouldn't shout at people and call them names. You know you shouldn't do it in public. These are basic things. The skills are not hard. What's hard is getting control of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's why the first phase of, of hard talk is work hard, where we look at what we call the brain drains. So we look at six ways that our brains work against us. And then for each one of those brain drains, we give what we call brain trains. So mm -hmm. these are the tools and techniques that the science suggests makes a difference. So I'll give you one example, one very basic example. We know that emotions lead to behavior. That's just a thing, right? If I'm angry, I'm going to behave one way. If I'm happy, I'm going to behave another way. Emotions lead to behavior. So if I want to manage my behavior, I need to manage my emotions. So what can I do? Well, there's about half a dozen examples of things you can do in, in the hard talk book and in the training. Um, but one really, really simple way is called effect labeling, effect labeling, also known as naming your emotions. Simple as that. So this is due to something called the conceptual act theory. So the idea is that by in that moment, by asking yourself, how am I feeling right now? Am I angry? Am I frustrated? Am I happy? Am I excited? Am I uh, miserable? Am I melancholic? Right? By naming that emotion, you are getting Homer to be quiet and putting Mr. Spock in, in, into the driving seat again, which then allows you to get control of your emotions, allowing you to get control over your behavior. Mm. The funny thing about this is, how very, very few people have a wide vocabulary of emotions. 
So you ask the average, um, mm. oh, I was going to say something controversial. I'm not going to say it. Oh, I will. You ask the average male accountant um, to name an emotion and it will be, I feel good. I feel bad. Right. So what, which is fine. But if we want to get that control, we need to get into the level of the, the, the granularity. So if you go to the website, if you go to hardtalk.info, you can download um, a free emotion wheel that actually has I don't know, 100, maybe a couple of hundred different emotions there split out to help you get into that granularity. Because by getting that control over ourselves, then we can hopefully help other people to do the same thing and everybody behaves better. We get better results. I think you're delving into emotional intelligence as well, in a sense, in that, yeah. you know, you need self-awareness, first of all, or you need to develop your sense of self-awareness so as to be able to ascertain what specific types of feelings you feel. And then granularity matters because if it's binary, good or bad, well, it will not help you move from Homer Simpson to Spock. So once you manage to improve your self-awareness skills or perception, and you get to know of yourself a bit more, then you can move into what they call self-regulation, which means you will be in a better position to rationalize the emotion in a way that allows you to keep control of yourself. Is it a fair representation? A I, think I, I, think that's, I think that's very fair. And I think the one thing that I see that all really good leaders have in common is that, is that ability to know who they are, how they are impacting other people, mm. and then making that decision in that moment, am I okay with how I'm impacting that person? So I'll, I'll give you an example. I work with one guy, he's very um, he's a big guy, older guy, white guy, gray hair, you know, central casting leader. Mm. And he's quite a gruff guy. And his people love him, but if he does this, they just they just stop, right? They will not speak. You as raise your eyebrow there. You raise your eyebrow, yeah. right? Okay. okay. He's done, and they they, they won't speak from now on. So I, I was working with them, and I said, you know, when you do that, they just shut up. Like you're never going to get any more from them. And he's like, oh yeah, no, I know that. I know that one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's fine. If he was a leader who was doing that and saying, mm -hmm. you know, I'm open door and I always want to hear from people and he wasn't aware that by doing this, he shut them up, that's bad. But if he's aware that he's doing that and he's okay with it, fine. Sort of a it's about the aware of the impact we're having on other people. Mm -hmm. So it's about understanding how, what the consequences of your actions are and being okay with it, right? Otherwise, Otherwise, there will be a misalignment, a misalignment between your intentions and your consequences. Exactly. So what we say in hard talk is we say there's, a, we say there's, there's two rules of adulting. So the number one rule of adulting is you're an adult. You can make any decision you like. You can decide to speak up. You can decide to, to shut up. Whatever. No, your decision. But you have to live with the consequences. That's the number one rule of adulting. Make any decision you like, but you have to live with the consequences. And the second rule of adulting is a little bit more complicated because the second rule says every action is a decision. In other words, even if in that moment you swear or you raise your eyebrow or you storm out of the room or whatever it is, and in that moment you're doing it because your cat died or because you're stressed or because you didn't sleep last night or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Other people don't care. Other people assume that your action is a result of your decision making. So if you are shutting them down, they're going to assume you don't care about what they have to say, whether or not that's true or not. They're going to make the assumption that your, your behaviors are, are rational. I think that's a very valid point. point in that, and thank you for mentioning it. I think that we should not assume as leaders, let's, let's say we are leaders. As leaders, we should not assume that our employees have empathy. We should not assume that and say they will understand that we are going through a rough day. The same for customers. I mean, imagine you treating a customer like garbage because you had a rough day. What makes you think that that customer will apply empathy to understand how you feel? So it's a, it's a false assumption. What do you think? 
Absolutely. And particularly, particularly now with, with, with the hierarchy as they are, right? Your average mm. CEO versus your average employer, there's such a gap. Outrageous to expect empathy. That's, that's mm. not your job as a leader. Absolutely not. And, and here's the thing, if you, don't, if you don't make it clear to people what you're going through, and you should, because you are a human being, you can expect empathy if you work for it, but you can't assume it. You have to be explicit with people about what you're going through. And I'm not so sure that's about empathy. I think it might be more to do with vulnerability. Yeah. Yeah. And openness. Mm. Yeah. That's a very fair point. Tell us about the spiral of dooms, another extremely interesting concept in your the spiral of doom the spiral of doom is is responsible for a lot of misery so the spiral of doom goes like this there is a thing i want to say but i am not going to say it because i am scared i am scared that if i speak up the other person won't like it and they will react in a way that makes me feel bad so i'm not going to say anything at all i'm not going to tell my boss that um it annoys me that he has uh, canceled my last five one-to-ones. I'm not going to tell my spouse that if he leaves his dirty, wet towels in the bath one more time, I may end up um, murdering him by putting him into the middle of them. I'm not going to say these things. I'm going to squash them down and squash them down and squash them down until I can't bear it anymore. And at that precise moment, I'm going to speak up. And I'm going to let my spouse know, and I'm going to let my direct report know, and I'm going to let my boss know exactly what I think of them with no filters, <clears throat> with, no, um, with, no, uh, with no intention of speaking softly, with no intention of listening hard, just getting it out there, communicating to them rather than with them. And guess what? Because I speak up like that, because I speak up under that kind of pressure, I don't speak up appropriately. I don't speak up effectively. So I do get that bad response. I get exactly the response I was worried about. And now, guess what? I have proof. I have proof that speaking up is dangerous. So what do I do? I go quiet again. So we go round and round and round and round and round in a spiral of doom and nothing ever changes, ever. It's a self-perpetuating illusion. It is. It, it is. reminds me of, a, in track and field, in sports, there is a sport with the 110 meters hurdles. You know, when the athlete has to jump over like 10 hurdles in a row. Okay. So okay. When, but the catch is this, because it's a matter of tempo and rhythm. If you hit the first hurdle, then chances are you will hit all of them. So you will throw all of them. You will be... So I think... It, 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 what you say is very interesting because you are caught in a vicious cycle of uh, of, in a, of, of, of of an inability to effectively communicate and to have the, those difficult conversations and the self-perpetuating conviction that those hard conversations never help you. And I wonder whether it's possible to break the cycle. Is 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 it possible to break the cycle? How do you break the cycle? Well, you know, you read the Hard Talk Handbook, obviously. Uh, you're absolutely right, though. It, it is. It is self-perpetuating. And it's worse than that because those same people then go out to the people around them in the organization and the new people joining the organization and, and make it clear, well, there's no point speaking up. Why would you bother speaking up? Nobody ever listens. And so nothing ever changes. And listen, that would be fine. That would be absolutely fine if people just cracked on with their jobs, right? If, if, if you're annoyed about something, if something is bothering you, if, if, if the fact that your direct report didn't get the work done on time or your peer isn't pulling their weight, if whatever it is that's bothering you, if you just put your head down and carry on working, whatever. But that's not what happens. So the research that we did, honestly, the, the statistics are frightening. And again, go to hardtalk.info and they're all up there. But 90% of people said that they had seen something, they had seen bad behavior at work. And only 30% of them spoke up. And they didn't just crack on with their jobs. They did other things instead. They talked about moving people so that they didn't have to deal with them. They transferred themselves. Some people left their jobs. They whinged, they moaned, they bitched, they back, um, they back gossip they gossiped about each other with the impacts on customer service with impact on productivity ultimately with an impact on the bottom line this is not warm and fuzzy stuff this has an impact on the bottom line and it, it doesn't have to be like this 
what we need are leaders who are prepared to walk the walk themselves, who are prepared to acknowledge that they can get better at this because it's not just about speaking up, it's also about listening up. You have to listen in such a way that other people are prepared to talk and who are prepared to train their people, who are prepared to give their people the skills, to give their people a common language so that they can do this. And again, this is not warm and fuzzy. The, 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 co the companies that are doing the best have this culture of candor. And it's, it's a much nicer place for everybody to work in the long run. What about managers or leaders who feel threatened by the possibility that by training their team to speak up, they may have expectations or they may threaten to take their position so they may be demotivated from promoting an environment of candor? Those people should not be in charge of people. <laughs> This is bad quality leadership. They should not be in charge of people. I am absolutely bored of listening to people tell me that they, um, and by the way, nobody ever says that they are um, that they are threatened by the people below them. It's the people below them who say, my boss is threatened by me. I, I can't read into their boss's uh, minds. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But there's certainly a lot of bosses who behave like they're threatened by the people around them. And I find it bewildering. Because the number one thing that the senior leaders I work with say is, I can't promote that guy because there's nobody below them to bring up. So if you want to move up the hierarchy, you need to move the people below you up the hierarchy. And look, it's true. By listening hard, you might learn things. And by learning things, you might have to change your mind. I don't know what to tell you. You know, it's, it's, um, it's like Warren Bennis said, In life, change is inevitable, but in business, change is vital. We need to be getting ahead of ourselves here. We don't want to be waiting and then going, well, what, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me there was a problem? You want people standing there going, hey, boss, 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 haven't you thought about this? You didn't think about that. Tell me. You want to get ahead of these problems. That's a very valid point. What, th there is also what we call the illusion of transparency in organizations, which says that a subordinate often feels or assumes that his or her manager knows how the subordinate feels. But the flip side is correct as well. So the manager often, fe often feels that the subordinate knows what the manager feels, like if, if he or she is very busy or if he or she is having a rough day. So at the end of the day, it all goes down to how effective communication is within an organization, as you said before, not only vertically, but horizontally as well, peer to peer between subordinates. And the, the better the communication quality is, the less the surprises will be in how people behave. What do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, the less bad surprises. Like every organization I go into, senior leadership will say, look, The thing we care about most is we would like to we'd like to get the bad news sooner, mm -hmm. right? Tell we want our people to speak up, right? We're, we're not on the front line. We we want to know the bad news. And I say, okay, well, what happened the last time somebody gave you bad news? And if the answer isn't, we threw them a party, and invited everybody and told everybody, then guess what? You're not getting more bad news. I'm I get paid to go in and tell you bad news, and I don't like giving you bad news. No, it's true that people, I mean, there are studies, I'm sure you have seen them, that people love positive feedback and they despise of critical feedback. But once we are aware of that rea fundamental reality, then we may delve into the hard talks philosophy, which is how do we navigate, talking about feedback now, how do we navigate the minefield of delivering bad news? which may affect people personally. Does it make sense? One of, one of my favorite things I think I learned when, when, when really getting into the, the, the details of hard talk was around intent versus content. Mm. And um, it's, the idea here is that if somebody that you love, somebody that you trust, somebody that you, that you rate gives you exactly the same piece of feedback as somebody that you despise or mistrust or dislike, 
you'll react completely differently to it. It's not the content of what you're hearing. It's what you think about the intent of the person who's speaking to you. So if you believe that their intent is positive, if you believe that they're on your side, then you can you can um, hear hear that feedback a lot better. And I'll tell you, in my work as a coach, that's definitely true. So be, because almost by definition, I'm being paid to go in and, and say, hey, what about this? People know that I'm on their side. So I get away with saying a lot more, I think. So if people believe and have faith in your intention that your intention is to serve the best interests of the client or the company or the employee or the subordinate, then you are in a much better position to be accept for your feedback to be accepted. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That. And perhaps this gives you better conviction as well when you are navigating through a difficult conversation that by focusing on your intention that, you know, my intention is win-win, right? My intention is to help you as well. If you are intention is, is positive, is good, is not ill-conceived, then, uh, you know, if, if, if you don't have hidden agendas, let's say, which create a different kind of environment, that should also give you confidence. And what about confidence? Is confidence a muscle? Yeah, look, absolutely. But before we talk about that, you're absolutely correct. But, and so in, in, in WorkHard, we have a thing called the decision tree, which again, you can download for free on the website. Mm -hmm. And um, it works you through that. And one of the first questions is, what is your purpose in, in, in having this conversation? Mm. And then it says, are you happy to share that purpose? And if the answer is no, then maybe you shouldn't be having this conversation. But if your answer is yes, then you can use that. And you can use that in a, in a, in a very specific technique that we call contrasting. So in other words, let's say that I'm going in and I want to have a conversation with you, Philippos, and you're my, you're, my, um, you're my peer at work. And we were both in a presentation last Thursday, a uh, client presentation, and I thought you could have done a better job. Mm. Right? I think you know, there was a couple of things you could have done better. So I can decide to have that conversation with you. And I might, I might believe that you might misunderstand my purpose. You might think that I'm trying to undermine you, for example, or make you feel bad. Whereas actually, I, I'm not. Actually, what I care about is making sure that we get this client because it's 70% of our budget for this year. So what I might do up front in that conversation is having asked you for, for permission to, to have a conversation, I might say something like, hey, listen, Philippus, um, I wonder, do you have a couple of minutes? I want to talk to you about that presentation we, that we did last week with, um, with client A. Um, before we get into it, I just want to be absolutely clear. I'm not trying to undermine you. I'm not trying to suggest you didn't do a great job. What I do want to do is just bring up a couple of things that I think might have allowed us to be even more effective with that client. So by contrasting that up front, your purpose, that long-term motivation, that can really help everybody to get onto the same page. But as far as confidence confidence is concerned, if there comes a moment where you are starting to enjoy telling somebody that they are bad at something or that they could be better at something or that they smell bad or that they are going to lose their job or whatever the bad news is, whatever the difficult conversation is, if ever there comes a time when you're like, yay, difficult conversation, then stop it. You're a psychopath. Don't do that. Right? That's not good. It should not be fun. It shouldn't be. Even when we're doing it for the right reasons, even when we know it's kind, even when we know it's the generous thing to do, mm. if we find it enjoyable, it's weird. Now, I find it enjoyable sometimes. Not a psychopath, not a psychopath. But because I'm, I'm really focusing in on the skills and I'm constantly, constantly trying to get better at this because it's really, really hard. Like, I've literally written a book about this. I think about it all the time. And I mess up on it all the time. I had a massive fight with my brother not not very long ago because I completely failed to do any of the skills here. It's hard. At the end of the day, I think emotional labor is what it is. One should not treat emotional labor as something unnecessary or bad or negative. Or so if if we need to invest emotional labor to help people we care about, okay? or to arrive at a purpose or a target with truly value, then so be it. We shouldn't like demonize the fact that it's not going to be 
a walk in the park or a or an emotionally neutral roller coaster. Does it make sense? You know, Patrick, Patrick Lencioni talks about this in one of the um, forwards to one of his books. He talks about how business practitioners get really annoyed with him when they read his books because they go, well, it can't be this easy. There must be more to it than that. And he goes, well, it's, it's, it's not that there's more to it than that. It's that just doing this is really hard because, as you say, it's emotional labor. It's about managing ourselves. That's really, really tough. Mm. It's much easier to go and open another spreadsheet or, or build another set of PowerPoint slides than it is to actually work on ourselves and work on our behaviors. It's much more difficult than it sounds. Um, yeah. Let me take you to the last part of our chat on the possibilities project. If you can share a yeah. few thoughts about, I think it's, a, it's something you're excited about as well. And then we move to the epilogue. So because I used to be a teacher um, mm. and because of hard talk, I ended up going in and doing some school visits in the United Arab Emirates mm. and realized that there was a gap in the market to help kids get ready for work. So there was a whole series of events, but I will speed up and tell you that we ended up last September deciding to put together a book for young people. So we put together 20 chapters. Each chapter is written by a different person and each person has a different focus. So we have a chapter on lifelong learning written by a lady who brought the very first bookstore to the Middle East um, and who set up the Emirates Lit Fest. We have a, a chapter all around um, feeling the fear and doing it anyway and being prepared to break the mold and go for gold by a lady called Amna Al Haddad, who is the first hijabi uh, female weightlifter, Olympian weightlifter. Uh, we have Her Excellency Noor Al Kabi, who is an Emirati uh, Minister of Culture, talking about what it takes to be successful. We have Zayuda Yousafzai, who is Malala, you know, the lady um, who was shot by the Taliban and who has her foundation for young women to get education. She turned, I think, 24, 23 yesterday. So her father wrote a chapter in the book as well. So all of that to say that we got the book written and um, we got 10, we got sponsorship, corporate sponsorship, and we got 10,000 copies printed, hard copies that are all over the UAE right now. But there is a downloadable free copy, exactly the same content, free across the world forever. Anybody who wants it, all you've got to do is to go to thepossibilitiesproject.co. Not www.thepossibilitiesproject.co, because that makes me sound old. Just thepossibilitiesproject.co. And we're also on Insta, but not very much these days, um, but at The Possibilities Project. Sounds all fantastic. And it was very, know, very fun. So you, you, you keep your plate full of activities and full of projects. That's really good for you. Well, we launched that on February the 8th at the Emirates Lit Fest, and it was basically the last normal thing that happened before all this happened. So, uh, yeah, I have a very nice kind of warm, fuzzy feeling when I think about it. Excellent. Then let me move to the last three small questions. First one, if you were to choose a noun to describe who you are, let's say you are prohibited from using more than one. <laughs> Will it be an author, a consultant, a trainer, an educator, a speaker? Ooh, that's a hard one. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go else? with teacher. I'm going to go with teacher because deep down that's, that's the thing, man. Yeah, teacher teacher lifelong yeah. teacher lifelong teacher yeah and lifelong learner and teacher yeah fantastic the second question is if you could give advice to your younger self right going back many years now let's what Wait, and I, I, enough with the many years rude i didn't mention number <laughs> so what would that piece of advice would be as to something to do differently perhaps no i no make enjoy every minute of it great then entrepreneurs you admire can you share some people you admire or you oh. look up to so, so 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 many but not not the people you're necessarily thinking of i don't think i'm not a big fan of the guys who um are in charge of companies that haven't made any money. I'm very old fashioned. I don't understand how that's a good thing. Um, very old fashioned. Um, I have 
huge, huge admiration for those people who are managing to do something in their own communities and build something that's sustainable and that they can grow out of those communities. I don't care if they're using AI, I don't care if they're using bottle tops, but something that's sustainable and that actually helps. Oh, and, and if they could possibly not refer to it as being unique, they'd get extra points from me. I'm very bored of people talking about everything being unique. <laughs> that's a fair comment. And lastly, any books you recommend? Of course, apart from your own, <laughs> it goes without saying these are highly recommended. Um, so nonfiction, A Suitable Boy, sorry, fiction rather, A Suitable Boy by Vikram Seth, one of the best books I've ever read. And it's about to come out in the movies, apparently. Mm. Super excited. Um, in Search of Excellence by Tom Peters from 100 years ago. Brilliant, brilliant book. Never been bettered, in my opinion. Anything by Lencioni. And my good friend Kristen Sherry's book, UMAP, which is genuinely one of the most generous books I have ever, ever, ever read. I have it. I'm, I'm sure it's behind you. I'm sure it's behind you. And I don't know if you know, but she's writing um, the equivalent now for kids, for like little, little kids, to help them to understand their strengths when they're even younger. Amazing. We talked about it during the podcast. You've got gifts. So it's a very, it's a very good uh, project that uh, helps kids see their own strengths and values. Yeah, I'm very happy that Christine is actually when we had the talk she said that uh, it's, in, it's incredible that i'm being paid to play so she found her zone of genius as she likes to say and it's, she recommended actually that we have this podcast and i'm grateful she's, to her she's the best. and she's i'm the grateful best. to you i'm grateful to you as well thank you for my pleasure thank you so much for the bus putting this together i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did i did very much and it's duty <laughs> this is the sri lankan uh, Sri Lankan. Thank you. It's duty. For whom is duty? Thank you. And thank you to our viewers as well who are watching from the various platforms. Have a fantastic rest of the week and we shall be in touch very soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thank bye you bye. all. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. I save a prayer for those who care. I keep the faith, but no one will dare to hold my hand until the end. When all the pieces fall into place, my body is weak, the mind is tired, but there's a fire that heals deep inside. I close my eyes and stretch my soul to gather.